So this is E658 lecture 4. Uh, last time around, we were looking at the, the spectral properties of ping pong sample and holds. Where the basic idea is to take a continuous time signal and use one sample and hold to sample every other sample. And we saw that if we denote the even samples by x e and the odd samples by x o, we saw that the total spectrum okay, uh, of the even bit stream is of the form x of omega by t minus 2 pi k over 2 t sum over k and the spectrum of the the odd stream is x of omega by t minus 2 pi k by 2 t times e to the minus j j pi k. So, this is the this is 1 by 1 over 2 t in fact. Right. And the bottom line was that you are sampling input signal at a rate of 1 over 2 t on each stream. There will be aliasing error incurred on both paths. However, when you add the two spectra together, what happens? The aliasing error gets cancelled so that the spectrum of the even stream is say something like this. This is the last time around we saw this was uh, pi then this was the there was 2 pi, 3 pi and so on. This is minus pi, minus 2 pi, minus 3 pi and so on. So, you also have an alias term like this and an alias term like this and so on. Now, the odd stream on the other hand so this is x e of omega this is x o of omega the only difference is that these alias terms are 180 degrees out of phase. So, what you have is, so when you add these two streams, the alias errors, this chap and this chap magically cancel out and you get the spectrum you would have seen if you had sampled the stream at a rate of 1 over t hertz. However, as we discussed last time, Every sampler has got several non-idealities x of t. Ideally, you want this to be sampling it uh, the input signal at every 2 kt and this is x of n. So, the errors were offset error. That means, you are getting some random offset. which stays constant from sample to sample, but is not known a priori. And what do we denote this by? By some y naught. Okay. Then, there is gain error. So, this is also a random error in the sense that 
the gain is actually some 1 plus delta uh, rather than 1 and this delta is basically some random quantity which depends on you know component matching something like that. I mean your, from your earlier studies on amplifiers you, you saw that for example if you had an op amp the gain would be 1 plus R2 by R1 blah blah blah. So, if R2 and R1 were, uh, were uh, not what you thought they were then the gain will not be exactly what you think it should be but slightly different. So, that is captured by this this uh, error term delta and uh, it is not known a priori. The third thing is timing skew. This is also random in the sense that instead of sampling at 2 k t in our particular example, it samples at some 2 k t plus t naught and t naught is also not known. So, the last time around we were looking at what happens, so the effect of offsets on the spectrum is what the, if you put in DC into the sampler you will get Y0, you will get Y1, Y0 y 1, y 0 and so on. Right? The reason this is happening is because the two sample and hold have different offsets. If you if you had, if, I mean if you had only one sample and hold and it was sampling at twice the rate, would offset be a problem? No. It would not be a problem, it just look like adding a, uh, you know, a random DC offset to the input. Now, what does it look like? It looks like you are adding an average offset of y0 plus y1 by 2 is the offset and what else? This is the error sequence, I mean correct, so the error sequence is y0 plus y1 by 2 plus y0 minus y1 by 2 cos pi n. So, this is the output you would get from the sampler if there was no input at all. And a little thought will show you that uh, if you took an ideal sample and hold and added this sequence, you will get what you would see with a time interleave, uh, this is of all, uh, I mean or a ping pong sample and hold where the offsets are different on the odd and the even sphere. Okay? So, if you looked at the spectrum of the time interleaved sample and hold, what is this equivalent to? You would mistake the input signal to consist of what all tones? So, this is a DC offset. What about this character? Is the sinusoid at? Fs by 2. So, this looks like, I mean, well, this uh, time interleaved sample and hold was now a black box. You looked at the sequence coming out and and uh, studied its spectrum and trying to inf and try to infer what input could have given you the spectrum. Correct? Finally, your discrete time sequence is a representation of the continuous time input. All right? And what you are trying to do is to look at the samples and figure out what the continuous time input is, isn't it? So, if you didn't know that there were two guys operating in ping pong, but you simply looked at the output sequ sequence coming out of this time interleaved system, it would appear as if there was not only extra DC added to the input, but also a looks like a tone at F s by 2. Now, the next thing is what happens when there is gain error. So, I will again copy and paste So, if the two gains of the 
the odd and even samplers were exactly the same, then this red guy here would perfectly cancel out with this red guy here and when you add the two you will get simply the spectrum you were expecting. Now if there is gain error the cancellation is no longer perfect. So you will see uh, this red stuff which has been highlighted in green will be cancelled to a large extent but will not be perfectly cancelled out. So to get a little more intuition let us see what happens when I actually have a sine wave. So if I put in a sine wave at frequency f in what will be the uh, uh, what do you think it should look like when I sample it at a rate uh, 1 over t hertz. See, I have a sine wave f in, I am sampling it at a rate 1 over uh, at a rate 1 over t hertz. In the discrete time spectrum, uh, what frequency will it look like? 1 over t looks like 2 pi. So, what should f in look like? 2 pi times f in times t. So, the sine wave of frequency f in will look like 2 pi f in times t in the discrete time domain. Hmm? So, if I put in a sine wave, what should I see? I would see two impulses and ideally I would see something here and since I am sampling it using a ping pong type approach, since I am sampling with a ping pong type approach, what I will see on the even stream is something like this. This frequency is nothing but, let me call this uh, omega in. This is nothing but omega in. What does this frequency correspond to? It is pi minus omega in. And the, the mirror image here is pi plus omega in and so on. Now, in the same fashion, On the odd stream, I will also have Here are something like this. So, if the two sample and holes were exactly identical, this chap and this chap will cancel off. Alright. Similarly, this chap and this chap will cancel off. These two guys will add up and you get what you expect. Now, if there is gain error, what do you think will happen? In the residual spectrum, when I add the two spectra of the odd and the even bit stream, what will, you, what will I expect? So, if there is gain error, so if this was in fact 1 plus delta times, this was all proportional to 1 and this was proportional to 1 plus delta, then this and this do not cancel and you will be left with a residual term with an amplitude of delta. So the equivalent spectrum will look like this, the discrete time spectrum will look 0, this is omega in this is, you will see some term at pi minus omega. So, this is pi. Similarly, this is minus pi and this will be minus of pi minus omega. Alright? And there will be of course, something at minus omega. So, these are the terms coming because of the Gainer.
and they will be proportional to delta. So this will be this will be proportional to uh, if this is 2 this will be delta. Hence 1 plus 1 is 2 in fact this will be 2 plus delta alright and this will be delta. More importantly what is the frequency at which you see the tones? It is pi minus omega n in the discrete time domain. So, if you did not know that inside you have two guys operating in ping pong, you would mistake the two sinusoids, yes and what are the frequencies of the sinusoids? That is f in and f s by 2 minus f n. The comment he made was that you could also interpret it as there being a tone at f s by 2 plus f n. That is definitely correct. In fact, you can even, you can always uh, interpret it as uh, I mean f s by 2 minus f n plus any multiple of f s because any number of tones can appear as f s by 2 minus f n. Does it make sense? So, now based on your intuition that you have if I had m sample and holes, I could have uh, instead of having ping pong that is two sample and holes interleave, I could interleave m sample and holes. So, what do you think will happen then in that case? If there was gain error between if, if everything had the same gain, okay, you will get what you expect which is equivalently it looks as if you have a uh, sampling rate of m by t. So, if uh, Okay, before I go there, let me uh, also in, uh, figure out why this intuitively makes sense. So, if the gain was exactly one of the two sample and holes, then the even and the odd samples will give you. If I put DC as the input, these are the even and the odd samples. Now, if the gain of the uh, the odd stream was slightly larger, right? Then what do you think will happen? This will become slightly different. So, will this and so will this. So, this is output sequence with gain error. If, if I had put in DC at the uh, input of this time interleaved sample and hold, and the two ga the gains of the, uh, the odd and the even sample and holes are not the same, then I for, uh, ideally I would have expected the same value to come out for all time. However, since the gains of the odd and even samples are diff slightly different, you will see that you will get the output will be uh, one value for odd samples and one value for even samples. So, looking at this what does it tell you? What are the uh, the what is the frequency content looking in at the sequence what can you conclude about the frequency content it is dc plus a sinusoid at fs by 2 and that makes uh, i mean and uh, from the previous argument if you put in omega in you see omega in and pi minus omega in if you put in zero you see zero and pi which is equivalent in the continuous time domain to dc and f s by 2. Yet another way of looking at the same thing is to see that you take the sequence x of n which is sampled at the correct rate which is at the rate 1 over t and multiply this by a sequence 1, 1 plus delta, 1, 1 plus delta and so on. And this is nothing but a constant value of uh, constant of value 1 plus delta by 2 and a sinusoid at delta by 2 cos pi. And when you multiply two sequences what happens? Convolve. So, if the input was a, if x of n was a sinusoid then when you multiply it by another sinusoid what happens? you will get two side bands, is not it? One is uh, it will be at plus pi plus omega n, one will be at pi minus omega n. So,
So, these are all equivalent ways the same thing though, I mean the only reason for doing, uh, trying to do this in uh, several equivalent ways is, is to kind of build intuition and to see uh, what has happened. Alright, now uh, let me ask you uh, a question. What do you think will happen if there are, this is an M way interleaved sample and hold? In other words, let me start with uh, three way sample and hold. So, so all the crosses are being processed by one sample and hold. Okay, all the boxes by the other one. Okay, and so on. So, what will be the effect of offset now? So, it's a three-way sampler. What happens with offset? If there is DC offset, what do you think will happen now? There will be tones at? Only at FS by 3. There will be, if you have three sampler and holes working in parallel, then if there are random offsets in each one of these sampler and holes, then you will see tones at FS by 3 to FS by 3. If there is gain error, There will be side bands around Fs by 3 plus minus F in, okay, 2 Fs by 3 plus minus F in. So, even though the uh, input was simply a continuous time single tone sine wave, when you look at the discrete time spectrum and try and interpret what the continuous time input was, then it will seem as if there were the input was not just one tone, but these myriad other tones and uh, uh, clearly the strength of all these tones will, will be related to the, to the gain error. And similarly, the strengths of these tones will be related to the magnitudes of the offsets in each channel. So, uh, the last thing that we need to consider is timing skew. And uh, I will just leave this uh, for your assignment. Uh, I want to make a couple of concluding remarks regarding sampling. Uh, one thing is the following. You can interpret, so, so far we have seen uh, an example of time interleaved sampling where it is possible to recover information regarding the continuous time signal by sampling at below the Nyquist rate, okay, please note that the, uh, the even and the odd sample and holes are individually sampling at rates below the Nyquist rate. The sampling only at a rate 1 over 2 T hertz, right. But using two of these channels, it is possible to figure out the uh, spectrum of the input signal in spite of the fact that this aliasing occur occurring on each channel. Does it make sense? So, this is uh, one example of what is called multi-channel sampling. So, I am not going to go into the detailed math, I just want you to be aware of this fact that, uh, so example 1 was what we have seen already, which is you take equivalently, you take the signal, you sample it at 2 k t and this is 2k plus 1 into t and this is nothing but a delay or advance, it does not matter. Okay. This is a, this is nothing but a linear time invariant filter whose transfer function is e to the minus J2 pi F T. This is equivalently what we were doing when you do time interleaving. Okay. So, from these two streams, you can manipulate them. 
by inserting zeros, uh, you know, skewing them and then adding them all up to get the samples of the original bit stream. Okay, I sampled it twice the negative state. In other words, sampling, converting the inputs into two streams and sampling them in a way, uh, sampling each channel at a rate below the Nyquist rate still results in no loss of information. You understand? So, it turns out that this is one special case of uh, what is called multi-channel sampling. So, it turns out that for example, if I had, if I took a signal which was band limited to 1 over T hertz, pass these through two analog filters and sample the output at, sorry, this is, uh, this has to be 2KT. So, if I sample this at 2KT, So, this is, you can think of multi-channel sampling, I mean time interleaved sampling as a special case of this guy here, where you take the input, you pass it through two continuous time filters and then if I sample them at one half the Nyquist rate, the Nyquist rate for this signal is what, I am sorry, the bandwidth is uh, 1 over 2T. So, you have a signal whose bandwidth is 1 over 2 T. If I sampled it at the Nyquist rate, I would have to sample it at 1 over T hertz. But it turns out that if I took this signal, processed it through two independent channels, I will, you know, uh, you know, I'll define what this independence is very quickly. But if I took this signal and passed it through two, within quotes, independent filters, alright, and sampled, and what can you comment on the bandwidth here and the bandwidth here? The bandwidth is still 1 over 2 T. So, the Nyquist rate for these signals is also corresponds to is 1 over T hertz. But I am sampling both these streams at not at Nyquist but at 1 half Nyquist. So, in each of these samples there will be there will be aliasing error. It turns out that it can be shown that based I mean looking at these two streams you will still be able to reconstruct the signal without any loss of information. And uh, one simple example which shows how this is possible is this case. If I treat this as, I mean time interleaving is simply I can think of it as taking the input signal, passing it through an ideal delay of time t and uh, uh, sampling both streams at 1 over 2 t hertz and you know taking these uh, the resulting streams and you know doing some digital processing and putting them back ok so can somebody tell me special cases where for h1 and h2 where this doesn't work at all so clearly if h1 equal to h2 it doesn't work so you can't cheat like that ok so uh, if these two are within quotes you know not the same or uh, i mean uh, Perhaps in your assignment, I will give you a, a problem which will help you figure it, figure what conditions must be satisfied on H1 and H2 to make sure that you are not, uh, you are not conning the whole system, ok. This is uh, very similar to, I mean, when you apply to US universities, you know, people ask for poor recommendations, why? If you think of the whole thing, it is nothing but a sampling process, right? So, they do not know who you are, you are the continuous time input, alright? From the samples, they are trying to figure out what you are like. Obviously, they could have asked for four recommendations from the same prof. It does not make any sense. Okay? So, they will, you know, I mean, the same thing happens with marriage alliance or, you know, if you are trying to find out how a prof is, right? What do you do? You do not ask the same guy four times. That is like saying, I will sample, the, you know, I have four paths, but they are all the same. It is useless. Instead of that, if I ask, four different people who have interacted with X or Y or Z, based on their individual prejudices, each of them will, you know, screw up the truth in some way, right. So, looking at the four outputs, I should in principle be able to filter the information coming from these four channels and make a best guess. That is basically what's happened. 
And one more case which, uh, so I will extend this proof uh, M channels. So if I had a signal, okay, passed it through M independent channels and sampled at 1 mth the Nyquist rate, I will be able to piece together information and you know figure out what the input signal was. It turns out, I mean, and if you are not conning on the on the M channels, right, they are reasonably independent, then you will be able to go and figure out what the original signal was and clearly as the number of channels become larger and larger and larger, okay, this figuring, figuring out process becomes more and more difficult to do in the sense that there is a lot more processing probably required to be able to get the, get to the truth, which makes sense also, right, so if you want to find out whether X or Y is uh, a decent fellow or not, uh, I mean, uh, the more and more people you ask, you have to, uh, you know, you will get, uh, you will get one opinion for him from everybody, right? And uh, now you have to figure out whether the fellows who are giving you the information are reliable or not. So uh, it all becomes a kind of a, a painful process. So it's the same thing here. So if you sample, you sample them at a much lower rate than uh, Nyquist. You will in principle be able to figure it out, figure out what the input is, okay. However, the process, the digital processing required on the, on the bit streams, on the digital streams that come out of each of these samplers becomes more and more involved, which is why, uh, you know, things like this are beyond two or three are typically not done. Uh, uh, a third example which you are familiar with, so in principle if m tends to infinity, then what does it mean? I am saying, if I take the analog, take an analog signal, split it into m paths, which are reasonably independent and sample at 1 m the Nyquist rate, then I will be able to reconstruct everything about the signal, just looking at these, which have been sampled at 1 m the rate. So if I now let m tending to infinity, what does it mean? <laughs> Using one sample, you will be able to figure out Everything about the signal. Is this something that you have seen or you have not seen? Okay, so uh, an example, what I was meaning to say was, if I took the signal, okay, if I found, uh, if I pass the signal through uh, a differentiator, S square, S cube and all the way up to S to the power infinity, and sample the outputs of all these signals, of all these paths just once, then will I be able to get the, uh, will I be able to reconstruct the signal everywhere? What is this? This is Taylor series. You understand? If I could, if at any point in time, I know the signal value and all its derivatives, I know the signal everywhere. Okay, as long as the signal is a decent signal. So this is nothing but the Taylor expansion. So, the Taylor expansion is basically a sampling theorem and this multi-channel sampling is, you know, the, the whole examination system is also, in a, is a multi-channel sampler, isn't it? So, you are tested in, uh, on languages and you are tested, tested on science and social studies and all these other stuff. What do you think it is? One way of monitoring whether you guys are working hard, you know, in school and all that is to, is to keep looking at you from 24-7, right? So, spend, put one guy looking at whether you are working hard or not and studying regularly and all that, you, you could do that, okay. That does not make any sense. So, what you do at the end of the, uh, at the end of the semester, at the end of the year, you have, you know, you have these different filters. One is the language filter, one is the, you know, social sciences filter, one is the, uh, the physics filter, one is the, you know, math filter and so on. And you sample the outputs of all these filters at once every six months or once every year. And based on the outputs of each of these filters, it, you know, you can go and reconstruct if you have been working at all during the year or been goofing off. So, multi-channel sampling is nothing new. It is, uh, you have been aware of it all along. Okay. Great. The next thing is to get to real stuff, which is uh, real circuits. Okay. So, When you want to sample, you want to basically catch something and hold it somewhere for some time, okay? Because you want, uh, as I, 
as I uh, indicated to earlier, we are interested not only sampling, we are also interested in taking the sample and quantizing it. Correct? So, it does not help if this uh, you sampled it and you forgot about what you sampled very quickly, you must be able to hold it for some time. Okay? And uh, what circuit elements are there which you know which uh, can uh, can remember the past? There, two varieties, you can either convert the input signal into uh, a voltage, uh, connect the capacitor across this input voltage at a particular time and then remove it, in which case the capacitor will hold a charge of value C times whatever voltage it, there was. Okay. Alternatively, you can convert the input into a current, pass it through an inductor and then what will you do to the inductor, once, the, uh, uh, once this current is running in the inductor, what will you do after that? You short the inductor so that this current continues to keep circulating. So basically you need mem uh, elements with memory and it turns out that inductors are big and bulky and all these other stuff so they are not practical. Uh, what you have with you are basically capacitors. And so the simplest sample and hold that you can, I mean sampling circuit that you can think of is basically So, if you want to sample at a rate 1 over T hertz, you have a, uh, you take a switch and this is V in and the switch is operated by some kind of clock waveform. This is the sampling frequency, I mean this is the sampling period which is T. So, whenever this waveform is high, the switch is closed, whenever the waveform is low, the switch is open. So, when the switch is closed, uh, what do you think will happen? The voltage across the capacitor is simply V in and the moment you open the switch, the charge stored on the capacitor, which was C times V in, has nowhere to go. I mean, the, uh, the input voltage is held on the capacitor until the switch closes again. So, uh, it does not help us to say we need a, uh, we need a switch which keeps opening and closing with, uh, with the help of uh, some control signal called the clock. The question is how do you implement this switch and uh, since we are all uh, we are predominantly dealing with uh, CMOS circuits uh, in this course, we will assume that we have access to MOS transistors. For those of you who have uh, seen the MOS transistor only as an active element, it turns out that the MOS transistor also can be used as a as a switch. So, you have uh, the source, the drain, the gate and the body and uh, analog circuits you have seen that if VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus VT and with VGS being greater than or equal to VT, VT, the transistor behaves like an incremental voltage controlled current source. Now, it turns out that if uh, the transistor is operated with VDS less than VT, then it enters in the, it is in the linear region and if VGS is greater than VT, it will look like a resistor so, if VDS is less than VGS minus VT and VGS is greater than VT, it will look like a resistor of value 1 over mu n C ox W by L times VGS minus VT and if VGS is less than VT, the transistor behaves like a open circuit. Since all of you have done devices and uh, if uh, clearly what happens when there is an open circuit is that there is no channel at all between the source and the drain. So, there is in principle no communication between the source and the drain terminal. On the other hand, when VGS is greater than VT, there is some channel charge and the channel charge, uh, the channel acts like some kind of resistor material which connects the source to the drain. 
and clearly the more the channel charge the less the resistance so an increase in vgs minus vt will cause the resistance of the switch to reduce and it turns out that the threshold of the mosfet okay so far we've always uh, used the constant value for the threshold uh, where we, because we have assumed that the the bulk the b is shorted to the source okay in, in practice it turns out that the threshold voltage is given by this expression Vt0 plus some gamma which is called the body effect coefficient times square root of Vsb plus some phi0 root minus phi0 yes there is hardly any point cribbing about the nature of the equation so this is the body effect coefficient phi naught is some built in potential or something like that I do not remember the details Vsb is the source to body voltage and uh, both phi naught and gamma are device specific and so is Vt naught the bottom line is that as V as the source body voltage is increased the threshold voltage as Vsb goes up Vt the threshold voltage increases the only thing that you need to be aware of is that if uh, VSB is increased from beyond 0, the threshold voltage increases and the body in an NMOS transistor must always be connected to the lowest potential on the chip. Is that clear to everybody? Why, why should it be connected to the lowest potential? Device must be to the lowest potential on the chip. So, the reason for that is that the MOS transistor is basically a, uh, a gate, an oxide and then there is a source this is a drain, this is the substrate so what is the what material is the uh, the substrate made of in an NMOS transistor P substrate what about the source and drain materials N plus ok so Clearly, if uh, the source goes below the substrate, so this is the body or the substrate. So, if the body, uh, if the source potential goes below the body, what can happen? Okay, you will forward bias this junction here. So, that's something you want to avoid. So, uh, the cardinal rule is that the body of an NMOS transistor must never be connected to a potential which is higher than the source. And since uh, the source can in principle go to any potential between 0 and VDD which are the lowest and highest potentials on the chip respectively, you see that the safest thing to do is to tie the substrate of the MOS transistor to the, to the absolute lowest potential on the chip which happens to be ground or 0. Hmm? So, the same thing uh, I mean a similar argument holds for the PMOS devices also. So, This is the body of the PMOS transistor, this is the source, this is the drain and this is the gate. So, as long as uh, Vsg is less than Vt, the device is off okay. and if Vsg is greater than Vt, but V S D is less than V S G minus V T. The device is operating in the triode region and operates as a switch, as a resistor. Of value one by mu P C ox W by L V S G minus and similarly, the bulk 
or the body in a PMOS device must be connected to the to a potential higher than the source or the drain. So it turns out that most modern, I mean a lot of modern CMOS technologies are what are called n well technology. Okay, so n well CMOS technology where all that this means is that the I, the bay, I mean you realize that all these transistors are made of the same silicon substrate, right? The substrate is a P substrate. So, if you want to make NMOS transistors on the substrate, you just, you know, you have, uh, you know, you put N plus and you put the gate and, uh, you know, if you want another transistor, you put another N plus, another N plus, another gate and so on. So, this is an NMOS transistor. Similarly, this is also an NMOS device. Can you make any comment on the bodies of the two devices? They are all the same. So if you want to make a PMOS transistor, what do you think you will do? The PMOS transistor must be made in an N substrate. It cannot be made in a P substrate, right? So you dope this with, with N and form a so called N well and make a PMOS transistor. like this ok and so this will be the body contact of all the NMOS transistors ok and since you made an NMOS you have the freedom of having a separate body for the for the PMOS transistors this is simply a technology related thing ok so, in an NMOS CMOS technology, all NMOS devices have the same body and PMOS devices can have their own bodies. Okay, the body terminals of each PMOS transistor can in principle be made separate because you can make one end well, make one PMOS transistor, make another end well, make another PMOS transistor and so on. If you want to share well, you can also do that. But in principle, you can also have this dedicated body terminal for each PMOS transistor. That is not possible for an NMOS transistor in a so called N well CMOS technology where you make the PMOS transistors in there in their separate ways. It is also possible to have what is called a dual well technology where you know you make you, you have wells around uh, the uh, NMOS and the PMOS transistors. It turns out that it is a little more expensive uh, than uh, having simply an N well technology. So, uh, most uh, majority of technologies today use what is called an NVIDIA technology. So, this obviously has got circuit implications, right? So, if you can tie the, if you have the freedom to tie the uh, body of the PMOS at one place, then you know that you can actually, you can probably use it in a circuit. So, in, in some places where you want the threshold to be a little smaller, you can probably tie the body to the source. Uh, in an NMOS uh, transistor, you have hardly any control over the body at all because it is always connected to the the bodies are all shared and it makes sense to connect it to the lowest potential only. Okay? So I will stop there and continue.